So Katie, thank you for joining us today. Thanks um, for having me. So my first question is, uh, why did you decide to leave the White House? Absolutely. So I decided to leave the White House uh, pretty much the last week of March of 2017. Um, we had spent the first, I would say, 60 days in office, 45 days in office, but really 60 days, even the two weeks leading up to the swearing in, working on repeal or replace legislation with, with Congress to repeal or replace Obamacare, which had been a cornerstone of Republican campaigns and messaging for the last eight, for the previous eight years. And it had been a conversation that almost every Republican elected to office um, had been promising their constituents. And we'd seen premiums go up in the United States on health care. And you saw really a fair amount of promises the Obama administration had made about what that, that legislation would do end up being the American public did not believe that their insurance had now gotten better. And so we spent the first 45 days really working closely with Paul Ryan, specifically in the House. In the United States, you've got to get legislation started in the House and pass the House of Representatives before it can go on to the Senate. And we'd spent um, what I would say a frustrating few weeks trying to get legislation on the floor that we thought could pass and send over to the Senate to ultimately get to the president's desk. And what we were noticing was we were losing the narrative in the, in the public about why we were doing this. And despite the fact that almost every Republican had now said to their constituents, we were gonna do this, the Democrats had been really effective they were organizing on the ground, setting up town halls in states across the country and scaring our Republican electors into thinking that the public no longer wanted them to do this. And so what we noticed was that from the White House, we really couldn't beat that narrative back to the level we wanted to. And unlike every other administration, well, I shouldn't say every other, unlike President Obama, there had not been an outside group that had been set up to kind of amplify the president's message the way that President Obama had had a, an outside group doing the same thing for him. And so, as you know, um, my background's really in politics. I'd never worked for the government before. It was a whole new experience for me. And so I went in and spoke to Jared and Reince um, and Steve Bannon kind of 10 days before, you know, March 20th or so, and said, gentlemen, you know, this is, this is a frustrating situation the president's finding himself in because he knows the American people want him to do this. He was elected as part of a cornerstone of his campaign was to do this. And we're not able to deliver because the Democrats and the left are beating us in the narrative on the ground. And they're scaring our, our Republican elected officials and saying that this shouldn't be done. I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna help start up an organization that cannot coordinate with the White House because according to American politics, outside groups cannot coordinate directly with the White House, um, but can help kind of organize and reinvigorate, if you will, the grassroots effort that we'd seen over the last six years against Obamacare and specifically the last 18 months for President Trump and remind these folks that had spent the last 18 months campaigning for the president, specifically six months campaigning for the president, that they couldn't just stay at home. They had to continue to remind Republican elected officials in the House that this is something they wanted to see done. And so that takes money, that takes time, that takes staff. So I left to go do that um, at America First Policies. We brought in a gentleman named Brian Walsh, who's now the president, no relation to myself. Um, and Brian now leads the organization. We raised and spent about $35 million over the course of 2017. Unfortunately, we did end up getting Obamacare repeal or replace legislation through the House. Unfortunately, we were not able to get it through the Senate. And that's one of the things we hope to um, perhaps bring up after the 2018 midterms if we're able to gain seats in the Senate. Um, but that was really my main force was saying, look, you know, it's been an honor and a blessing to work in the White House. It's something I never dreamed I'd be able to do and I'm incredibly grateful for it. But my strength and the way I can help the president the best is actually outside the White House, not inside the White House. And so that's why I decided to leave. Um, so during your time at the White House, did you feel that there was a divide between members of the Trump administration who were fully committed to say, drain the swamp or uh, lock her up and, or less traditional means, uh, and members like yourself who came from a more traditional Republican background? Uh, and do those, do those divisions still exist today? I don't know if I'd call them divisions as much as I'd, as I'd call them. Um, it took us time to get to know each other. Unlike most administrations, as you guys know, President Obama and even President Bush, if you took a listing of the staff that they had come in with them in, in the West Wing specifically, most of those folks will have worked with that, with that president, with that candidate, with that team for two or four years leading up to their time in the White House. And that gives you an opportunity to gain a level of trust, level of understanding, um, and a working relationship with those people that we just hadn't been able to have because the Trump campaign was such a small operation and it really speaks to the value and the strength of the president himself as it relates to the role he played in his own campaign. 
on the right side of the aisle in the Republican Party, we'd never seen a candidate that literally ran his own campaign as much as the president did. He was his own communications director. And a lot of people will say that really, President Trump's campaign was a 747 himself and a Twitter account. And there's not, I mean, there's not a lot of, outside of the RNC effort, which I'll talk about, um, I'm sure at a, later in this conversation, there isn't a lot of facts to, to disprove that. And so what I noticed where there are a lot of new people around and that there have been people that have been around the president for a long time, a small group of them, and just like anyone, it is human nature. When you go into a situation that, you are un, that you're unfamiliar with to begin with, these people had never worked in the White House either. They'd never worked in government. Most of these people had never worked in politics. They're coming in and they're seeing all these new people around them in, all, in this new space. And it is human nature to have this a little bit of a distrusting and a little reticent as to what, how's this working relationship gonna work? How are we gonna get things done together? What do we agree on? What do we not agree on? So there was a little bit of a kind of time period to allow people to get to know each other. Um, but I, I would largely say that, you know, the first couple months you saw that play out somewhat more publicly than you see it now, because I think there's been a real kind of, um, a real time has passed and, and let people kind of get to know each other better. And I think it's, it's worked out really nicely. Um, do you think that's the reason um, Trump's administration has had a high turnover? Or do you think it has to do with his leadership, leadership style? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I think there's no question the president was elected by the American people as a disruptor. Right. I mean, people wanted change. They wanted something different. They wanted Washington to not look or feel the same because the, the results they were getting from Washington and what they saw their lives look like as it related to how the government interacted with them was something they weren't happy with. And so the president brought in number of staff at all different levels, whether it be cabinet agencies, the West Wing, um, independent agencies, wherever it might be. And I think he at different po times in his administration has different priorities for those for those for that staff for that department for that agency and there's a time period that that staff are there serving his purpose and i will tell you the president is not afraid of saying great thank you for your service you've served your purpose now i need someone else because i'm trying to get something else done because he doesn't see it as a personal slight he sees it as he was elected to fix a number fix things for the american public and the american public asked him to do that he was very clear in his rallies and in his twitter account and in his public statements that he was determined to go to Washington and have it operate differently. And so he wasn't so concerned anymore about, oh, well, this person's only been here for six months and historically that person serves in that position for two years. But he would say, you know what? This person served their purpose. I've gotten done what I want. Now it's time for someone else so I can get another accomplishment done. And I think that's fundamentally different than how most administrations would view it. Because most administrations would say stability is what people want. But our 2016 election would tell you that stability was not what the what 63 million Americans voted for in 2016. Um, as a follow-up question, what do you think Trump's um, greatest achievements have been so far? In tax office? cuts. Um, three things I'd say. One is tax cuts, which I think will be the primary uh, driver of the 2018 midterm conversation. Um, number two, I think there's no question that from a judiciary perspective, he has. Um, Gotten no has nominated and gotten confirmed, I think, more appellate court judges than any president uh, in history, given his amount of time length in office. It was, I think, 13 or 14 as of February. I know it's increased since then. Uh, Neil Gorsuch, as, as Supreme Court Justice, was a huge, huge win for the Republican base, um, the Republican general, Republican Party as a whole. Um, and I think the third thing that people, that's not as sexy, and people don't talk about as much, but a deregulation. We had seen over the course of the Obama administration, thousands of regulations get put on, small, specifically small businesses in our country, made it incredibly hard for people that wanted to start business and employ people to do so and to make money doing so. And so I think the most recent tally I saw was he's cut 1,700 regulations for a tune of $2.8 billion of savings over the next 10 years in regulatory um, costs that are now being, that will be wiped off. Um, for every new regulation, he's taken 22 regulations off the books. And, you've, and therefore, you've seen re the Republican economy boom under this. You've seen people willing to start businesses again. You've seen people hiring more employees again. You've seen people reinvesting in their business again. Because they're not as worried about the layers and layers of regulation that will be laid upon them by the government. And the Republican viewpoint in general is get the government out of the way of the citizens wanting to do what it wants to do. Obviously, there are laws. Obviously, there are things that we need to do to safeguard and make sure that people are operating in an upstanding way and are not, and are not hurting anyone else in doing so. 
but largely let's make sure the government is here to get not to impede people from doing what they want to do, but to get out of their way. And so I think um, three of the things that I would say are most impressive are, are the judiciary deregulation and the tax cuts. Thank you. So speaking of the midterm elections, um, you've been heavily involved in some past Republican campaigns, uh, both at the state and national mm -hmm. levels, um, especially uh, on the vote operation, uh, voter ID and the RNC's data collection and predictive modeling. Yeah. Um, obviously, the use of data has been um, undergoing a lot of uh, controversy and uh, scrutiny, especially with the Cambridge Al Analytica scandal. Mm -hmm. um, how effective do you think it is as opposed to traditional forms of campaigning? And how much further do you think it has to go? Sure. So there's a lot there, so I'm going to unpack that um, a little bit. So first of all, I think that data is incredibly important, but it goes hand in hand with traditional campaigning. And I don't think in today's political world, either one succeeds without the other. Um, and so that's where I'd start with that. The second thing I'd say is I think that there are a lot of private companies that have tried to um, kind of interject themselves into the conversation of political data. And there are obviously roles for those companies to play. I'm not specifically Cambridge. Is, I'm someone that was uh, publicly against uh, what Cambridge is trying to do in the 2016 election. And I, I was very um, vocal about that with the Trump campaign. But there are good private data companies that operate in the United States that help us learn about data and, and fine tune our, our operations, et cetera. But one of the things that was a real cornerstone that the Republican National Committee that Reince Priebus kind of undertook during his second chairmanship in 2012, after the 2012 election, was saying that the party should actually control the data. It shouldn't be Cambridge Analytica. It shouldn't be, I'm sure some of you've heard of the Koch brothers in the United States. Um, it shouldn't be an outside entity. It should be the party that controls the, the voter file. Because ultimately, the party's voter file is controlled by, by folks that are elected by members of the Republican Party. And so it's not a private company that can go do who knows what with this data. But there's an entity that is controlled by state and local officials that are voted by Republicans in those states and, and counties. And therefore, there's more accountability as to what the data can be used for. So that's something that I think is really important to talk about. And I think secondarily, the other thing that's just anecdotally important is that the RNC, as it maintains its voter file, does not have any private information on anyone. We only hold and, and um, try to acquire publicly available data. And so some of that data needs to be purchased because it's publicly available data that other companies accumulate and do a lot of uh, refining on, but we only buy and hold on to publicly available data. And so um, I actually have to give my husband, who's with me here, some credit. Mike Shields, uh, who was the chief of staff under Reince Priebus in 2013, 2014, we spent a lot, Mike spent a lot of time coming in in the 2014 cycle and saying, we've gotten beat in the last two cycles on data. We've spent a lot of time having donors and, and other people say Republicans will never catch up, the Democrats are going to win forever. And we had to fundamentally look at what the Republican Party was going to do differently to be ready for 2016. And one of the core differences between what we have built at the RNC and what the Democrats had built in 2008, 2012, and therefore their challenge now, is that Obama built a data operation built to elect Barack Obama. He built it in Chicago with hard dollars from his own campaign, with staffers that worked for Obama for America, and he built it to elect Barack Obama which is great if you're electing Barack Obama. As you guys know, we have term limits in our country in, uh, as terms of president, and a president can only hold two terms. And so what we said was, look, no question, they, out, they outdid us in 2008, 2012, but they're not selling Barack Obama in 2016. And so Mike went back with Reince and said, we need to build a data operation that elects Republicans, not specifically one candidate. So that moving forward, it wasn't that we were only going to win in 2016 or 2020, or excuse me, in 2016, it was that we could win in 2016, 2018, 2020, 2022, 2024, because it was a database and an operation that was built to help candidates under, or to help that could be, I, I shouldn't say changed or altered, but could be used by any candidate with their message to look at their electorate to figure out how, how to help them win. And I think Hillary, um, I always say that I wish I could like, have like, an iPad with me and show this at every um, speaking engagement I have, but Hillary, I think three or four months ago, literally went on stage at one of her speaking engagements. And she's still obviously very upset that she's lost, which is understandable, and she still kind of can't, can't wrap her head around why or how. And one of the fingers she's pointing is at the DNC. And she's saying, I walked into the DNC in August of 2016 and they had nothing. They had no data, they had no infrastructure, they had no staff. And I basically had to fund the party 
We had a 120 day sprint to the general election and the Republicans had been working on this for four years. And the crazy thing about that was we'd been working on it for four years, really not knowing who our nominee was gonna be, right? And so Mike and Wrights had to build a data operation that could elect a candidate of which we didn't know who it was gonna be. We definitely didn't think it was gonna be Donald Trump in, in February, March, and April of 2013 or 2014. Meanwhile, the Democrats basically knew <laughs> that Hillary was gonna be their nominee. And, and yes, that you know, Bernie obviously made a run for it and there were obviously things that could have happened, but if you were the DNC in 2013 and you had spent three years building a data operation to elect Hillary Clinton, that would have been scarier for us. But we're still basically looking at a party in the DNC that's almost bankrupt, um, has not made any real, I would say, forward motion on building their own data infrastructure that's kind of a democratic data set that's helped allow us Demo uh, to elect Democrats. Um, and Even so I, 2016. I, we've not seen anything to show that they've done anything. And you can, in the United States, the party committees have to report how much money they raise and how they spend it on what's called a, on an FEC report. And so one, one of the things that I always laugh about is reporters will ask you all day long, what do you think the DNC is doing? Or have you heard the DNC is doing this? And my response is, well, have you seen anything on their FEC report to show that they've raised or spent money to, to do that? And the reality is I think they've got, you know, five or six million in the bank and they've got eight or nine million in debt. And you see no spending on their side to, to show you that they've started investing in anything that would scare us to think that they're starting to get their act together. And I was on a panel a couple months ago with a, um, at Microsoft with the new DNC CTO at the time, who I think someone just recently told me has actually left since I did a panel with him. So that could also be concerning for them. But he had come in from Uber. And the DNC had hired him away from Uber. And they said, you're gonna help us, you're gonna be our fix all, and you're gonna help everything, you're gonna build a whole data infrastructure, and we're gonna crush the Republicans again in 2020. And on this panel, I was kind of waiting to see what he was gonna say in terms of, don't worry, I know, the, I know in 2016 it looks like we got leapfrogged, but you know, that was, it was a one-off, and we know what we're doing, and we're better at this. And he sat there and said, well, we need to study what the Republicans did and just do what they did. And I was like, well, great, because I, that's music to my ears. I'll take that all day long. Um, and so those, that's kind of the two. And then the third part of your question is this, I mean, I think that so the data operation, how important data is in elections will continue to grow. Um, one of the new things I think will be in American politics is we've spent a lot of time this past cycle acquiring and communicating people on, with, on email. In the United States, you can buy email lists. Um, and so we, we've spent a lot of money doing that. Reince Priebus, I give him a lot of credit um, he spent seven figures on acquiring email lists and went into debt in 2015 to do so with the bet that if he bought those email addresses and was able to communicate with, the, with those people in the 2016 cycle, that he'd be able to raise enough money and communicate with enough voters to, to win the election in 2016. And the bet, bet paid off, I believe. Um, and the new thing is SMS will be text messages. We believe in the next two to four years, people email will be somewhat secondary and people will do almost all their communicating on text message. The harder thing on SMS is you can't buy an SMS list in the United States. They have to opt, people have to opt in and tell you that you can communicate with them on text. And so it's a much more expensive, much more time consuming, laborious process than acquiring email. So that's kind of the new thing we're trying to work on. So how are you feeling about the upcoming election cycle with the midterms, um, specifically with regards to the Senate? Um, as you mentioned, the health care bill has to pass through. Do you expect Republican gains? Um, I feel better than I did a year ago, and I feel better than I did six months ago. And so what, what political operatives would tell you is trajectory matters, momentum matters. And so I'd much rather be us than, than the Democrats right now. A year ago, on the generic ballot, which in the United States, what generic ballot is considered is if you were to poll someone on the street and ask them generically, would you vote for a Republican or a Democrat, no candidate name attached to it? Democrats had a 17 point advantage on Republicans. Six months ago, it was six to eight point advantage on Republicans. As of two weeks ago, it was three points. So we have, the Republicans have seen that, that margin, the Democrats were up on us narrow and narrow and narrow. Um, so I feel better than I did uh, a year ago. I'd also say that Rasmussen does a daily tracking poll in the United States uh, on approval for the president. Um, the president hit 50% today again, which is his seventh time during his presidency that he's hit 50% approval. And I think we've continued to see his policies um, become more and more popular, and as well as his own popularity, which has been as low as 38, is now up between 43 and 44. 
and specifically on policies we're talking about right now with, as it relates to North Korea and other foreign relations topics that the president's engaging on, that it's, they're hugely popular conversations that the American public has really, really been responding to positively in terms of how the president's been engaging. And so what I like right now is the conversations we're having as, as a country in terms of things the president's are, president is involved in, the, the public largely favors those conversations and thinks the president's doing a good job on those. And then I'd also say, and, and, and I'm not sure if, if UK elections tend to have the same thing, but as elections become closer, legislatures start doing less, right? And so I would, I'd be pretty shocked if we saw any major, major legislation get through between now and November. We'll obviously have some things we've got to get, some are, we have this budgetary issues that we have to get over in terms of funding the government, et cetera. But I'd be shocked if we saw much on the floor between now and then of the House of Representatives. And so that means that we should be largely able to talk about what we've done in the last 18 months. And I think there's a huge amount of accomplishments to talk to the American public about. And so we'll spend time talking about judicial appointments, deregulation, um, tax cuts, and they'll, t and they'll spend time talking about how offended they are by the president's Twitter account. And I think we win that conversation every time. Absolutely. So you mentioned uh, foreign policy, so let's talk a little, a little bit about that. In recent weeks, Trump, the Trump administration has imposed um, tough financial sanctions against Russia. Uh, do you think the sanctions will be an effective way to reduce uh, aggr Russia's aggressive foreign policy? I think it's a step in the right direction, and I think it's a step that the American people um, want him to take. I think especially after seeing what we've seen, the Senate and House Judiciary Committees came back and said that Russians did try to meddle in the U.S. elections. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to need to continue to do things to kind of push on Russia and say, no, we're not going to allow you to do these things. We're not going to allow you to operate in ways that the U.S. doesn't approve of. And so I think the president saw sanctions work as it relates to conversations that had ha been had in 2015, 2016 and against Iran. He's seen um, sanctions work in other, I think, international um, efforts that he's, that he's studied. And so I think he thinks it is a first step and having, a, a, having leverage in a negotiation with Russia. Um, does the RNC and the Trump administration have any other concrete plans in terms of trying to stop Russian interference in the upcoming midterm elections? So I'm not that I'm um, aware of. The Senate and House Judiciary Committee have, have produced reports on this. And so this is something that we take very seriously in our country. And so that's really something that will be more regulated, um, I think, by, by Congress than by the president himself. I know the president is very adamant that we take a, a strong look at this and make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, and that's a very scary thing and something that we should take very seriously. But I, the RNC nor the president, I think, has any official statement on that, other than we need to do everything we can to stop it. Absolutely. Um, so having withdrawn from the Iran nuclear deal, many argue that America is acting against Iran and many European firms that trade with it. Um, do you support President Trump's decision? To pull out of the Iran, yes. Um, I think we've lost sight about how bad this deal is. I think everyone hears deal and they think, well, wow, this is so great. Like, why would you pull out of a deal? We've made, a, we've made an arrangement with someone. A deal's a good thing, right? And when you go back and you look at the framework of this, of this deal, it is, <laughs> it is astounding to me that it, people could say that this makes people feel more safe as opposed to less safe. And so someone disagrees with me, so those will be a fun debate later. But, Essentially, what you have to understand about this deal is the sanctions on Iran worked, right? I mean, we devalued their currency 73%. We basically made it impossible for their banks uh, to operate and impossible for them to sell oil internationally. Um, we really brought them to the table in a way that um, gave us a huge amount of leverage as a negotiator. And then we sat down with them and they basically took us took us for a ride on this. I mean, we sat down with them and they were at a place where we knew that we fundamentally had to change our sanctions or they were gonna be in real trouble. And instead of continuing to push on them and, and us setting the rules, they were really able, in my opinion, to say, no, 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 no. I, we know you've, you've sanctioned us and we know we need this money back and we know we'll only be successful if we get these sanctions relieved. But we're gonna do it on our terms. And so you have to understand that essentially what the United States agreed to, to me, I couldn't understand what the definition of success looked like for the folks that were sitting down making this deal. Because there were two, I think two or three things that are really important. One is by, by making this deal, we we're gonna allow them to have $100 billion of assets back at their discretion. 
that they could do whatever they want with was essentially could be a terrorism slush fund for all we know. That's number one. Number two, there's absolutely no ability for us to go in and, and, and take a look at what they were doing. If we believed that they were in some way um, going against conditions that they agreed to, Iran was able to stall us going in for 24 days until they had to let us in to see what was going on. So in 24 days, you can get rid of a lot of evidence, right? So let's pretend that the United States believed that they had gone against part of the agreement, that we asked to go in, they wait 24 days to let us go in, we still go in, we still say we think they've gone against part of this agreement. That allegation then goes in front of a committee, of which Iran sits on. So they're basically regulating themselves and apparently holding themselves accountable for if they violated this agreement or not. If that, that committee then has 30 days to decide whether Iran's violated the agreement or not. If that committee can't figure out if they violated the agreement or not, it then goes to the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council then has another 30 days to say whether or not Iran violated the agreement. And if the, Iran, if the UN Security Council then comes back and believes in any way that's, that Iran has violated the agreement, Iran then wrote into the deal that therefore Iran no longer has to, be, has to comply with any part of the deal and it's essentially null and void. So my question is, what was the, what was the goal of this deal? Because in this deal, they were now allowed to acquire ballistic missiles again. They were allowed to acquire conventional war, warfare, um, miss, I mean, not missiles, but uh, methods again, which our own Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time said they would, ne under Obama, that he sees no deal under which we should allow them to acquire ballistic missiles again. So B Obama's head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 2015 said that there nothing, for nothing, should we allow Iran to acquire ballistic missiles again. But yet Joe Biden goes over there and says, no problem, here's the Iran deal, you guys can self-regulate, you can stall us for 24 days to go in, you can sit on your own committee to tell us whether or not you violated the agreement, and we'll give you $100 billion. Sounds great. So to me, it, I mean, it, it seems to be a, um, a question of what was our definition of success going into that, because I can't figure out what we thought we were getting out of that agreement. Thank you. So my final question before we open up um, to the audience. So this week, President Trump introduced a plan to lower the cost of drug pr prices for yes. consumers in America. Uh, the proposals include compelling pharmaceutical firms to list their prices in their advertisements. However, President Trump stopped short of keeping his populist uh, pledges, such as allowing Americans to import prescriptions from other countries, which has led to an increase in the share prices of leading drug companies. Why do you think President Trump fell short of his promises uh, in order to favor corp corporate interests? I don't think the president's fallen short of his promises. I think the president has sat down with a number of people and said, what is the best way to lower drug prices? And sometimes the way that someone thinks is the best way to do something, when they sit down and talk to people and experts and have a really large conversation with shareholders and stakeholders, it ends up that the, maybe the original way they thought to do it isn't the only way to get it done and maybe isn't even the most effective way to get it done. And so I will tell you, the president, as you said, I mean, the president campaigned on this issue over and over and over again. It's a huge, a huge issue in, this, in our country. And I don't think the president will stop at all to make sure that he, he delivers on that promise. Do I think that the form of which that, um, that takes on might look different than, than when he was campaigning? It might. But I think that will be uh, in regards to meetings that he's had with people to show him, sir, and, you know, these are other ways we can accomplish these same goals. And we might actually be able to bring drug prices down more if we do this than if we do other things. Um, you know, one of the concerns about um, really going after the pharmaceutical country in the United States is how much these pharmaceutical countries spend in, pharmaceutical companies, excuse me, spend in research and development of new drugs. And so you have to take into account all the time that if, if, you, if you really penalize the pharmaceutical industry, is that going to mean that the amount of research and development that these companies do to find new drugs to help cure new diseases is an opportunity cost that, become, that comes of that. And so I think what the conversation's been had uh, in Washington has been, are there other ways to bring drug prices down that maybe doesn't simultaneously put into question um, the great leaps and, and experiments that we've had in, in R&D that have caused new drugs to come to market that have been life-saving drugs? Thank you. So now we'll take a few questions from the audience. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to get to you. Um, we'll start with the hand all the way in the back. I bet this is going to be about Iran. 
Forgive me for coming a bit late, but I uh, didn't get to catch the first 15 or so minutes of your talk, so I'm not um, immensely clear if it was clarified then or not. <laughs> but um, it's been vaguely interesting to hear vaguely. Um, the other side uh, <laughs> on a lot of contentious issues that we're hearing from across the pond. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, while I feel that um, level of discourse is important, uh, what I really feel is quite surprising is that a lot of people here, you know, c would have to listen to you talk about the details of, you know, some more obscure policies where if it comes to a more Republican mindset on um, medicines to a more, like, misleading rhetoric on um, the Iran deal. But maybe <laughs> the more, most pertinent question is, um, since you found the time and thought it was correct to dedicate a certain amount of time in your career to being part of, not even by voting, but helping and actively being a part of an administration such as Trump's, which advocates for things like sexism and racism. Grab them by the pussy. These people coming in the borders are not humans, they're animals. How do you so effectively divest yourself of any kind of moral rectitude to support such a terrible regime? Unless you count yourself as a mediating force to these disgusting, frankly disgusting opinions, unless you count yourself as a mediating force, how do you so, in your day-to-day -day life, completely disregard all these awful things that have gone on and find it worthwhile to commit your life and your career to helping this kind of administration? I, I, look, I very much appreciate that question because I think that question gets to the heart of what's going on in American public right now. There are a lot of Americans that would have stood up and said the exact, I don't know if you're American or not, forgive me, but there are a lot of Americans that would stand up in America right now and say the same exact thing and ask me the same exact question. And my response to that person would be there were 63 million Americans that voted for President Trump in November of 2016. Why do you think they voted for the president? They voted for the president because they believe that a number of things in this country, in our country, excuse me, in the United States, have caused them to believe that their children's future is no longer as promising as they think their future was. And those things are very scary to them. And so they've heard people like President Obama, who is incredibly eloquent and really well-spoken and educated at Ivy League institutions, and I think by all accord would say publicly has always done nothing other than speak politically correct, made people feel good, get a nice warm fuzzy feeling. And what's happened is people have lost their jobs, their healthcare premiums have gone up, they don't know how to afford sending their children to college, and they're largely in debt. And so, I'm That's sorry. That's not factually true, because the economy has consistently gone better on Obama. Employment has consistently gone better so under I think that's Obama. Interesting. And it, no, no, I think that's a point to be made, first of all. And also, while the question so two isn't, things. The question isn't, question is not what you've started off and talking about why people in America have um, decided to vote for Trump. Because they have the excuse of being in terrible positions, economically, socially, where they have no other choice, where they feel maybe the way to do is disregard racism and sexism to get to the point of maybe this guy will give us some kind of change. You, in your position of privilege, why do you think that it's morally acceptable to back a candidate who has all these terrible, disgusting um, attributes mm -hmm. in, in this society? Purely, is it purely because you think that maybe Republican politics are slightly better than Democratic politics? No. Thank you. Let's stick to that one question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. So first of all, I would, I would like to completely reject the idea that the president is racist or bigoted. <laughs> I would completely oh, reject to that. No, that's bullshit. You can't say that. I'm very sorry, but to deny please. racism like this... Please, sit down, please, sit down. So let's talk about what the president said in relation to animals this past week. Would I have specifically used that term in that conversation? I don't know. Here's what I do know. The president was vastly, was taken way out of context. He was talking about members, gang members of MS-13. Let's talk about what these gang members do to citizens in, the American, in, the, in America. Rape, kill, behead, beat to death. They take advantage of poor, underprivileged, uneducated kids in our country who are not, mister, given the privilege that I am, to go to good schools, grow up in a loving family, and have the opportunity to be part of, of an economy and of a society that I feel loved and taken a part in. These gang members co-opt these kids, cause huge amounts of violence and drugs in our country. And let me tell you, if you had a family member, if you had a family from the United States up here whose daughter had been raped and killed by a member of MS-13, and you told them that you were so appalled 
at the president calling that person an animal, that you thought that someone that was going to help fix the problem of MS-13, that that wasn't worth it to you, they would call, they would say BS. When you stand here and you've had your daughter killed by a member of MS-13 and you see a president who is having meeting after meeting, public conversation after public conversation saying, I'm going to do whatever it takes to stop this violence in this country, we will not live in a country where this is accepted. Then you can sit here and tell me how appalled you are by him calling this person an animal. He did not call the United States minority population, immigrant population, Hispanic population animals. He said members of MS-13. He said Mexicans crossing the border are rapists and- As it relates to a conversation having to do with MS-13, because there was an ICE officer, there was an ICE officer sitting two seats down from him who was talking about how because of the current regulation in the United States, as an ICE officer, he cannot work with the immigration folks in our country to tell them that he has a concern that that, mem that, that person's a member of MS-13. That was what that was in relation to. All right, next question. We'll go to uh, the gentleman in the second row. Uh, with the blue, yeah, okay. blue shirt. Wait um, for the microphone. I'm going to change the tone a little bit. Um, <laughs> I, I actually, I worked on the Hillary Clinton campaign and something that astounded me is the people I talked to on the ground that did share these concerns that you're talking about. So even though I come from a different party, I tried to keep as open of a mind as possible going to the administration and, and listen to these concerns. Um, because these people that voted for Trump, you know, I, I know them personally. I come from the Midwest. I understand. So question for you is what bought you into Trump. I'm sure there are a lot of concerns about his character. There are these um, things that people feel very strongly, clearly. Um, what sort of brought you into the president and his policies um, to do with his personality or his leadership style? What sides of him do you see that maybe not everyone sees? Well, thank, yeah, thank you for that question. Was, um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. So I've worked, obviously, in very pro close proximity with the president. Um, between when he was a candidate and at the end of March of 2017. Um, and I will tell you, he's incredibly charming in person. And he, um, he has a very, very real concern about what's happening in America right now. He is someone that acknowledges that he came from a level of privilege. He is someone that acknowledges that he was given more than most people in, this in America were given to start out with, right? His dad loaned him a million dollars to start his own company. Um, most Americans don't have that opportunity. But I will tell you that the president has never been part of what I would call conventional elite society in the United States. He just hasn't been. He hasn't run in those circles. And he knows what it is like to be on the outside of part of, of, part of American society. And so he has spent his whole career em employing a, num a lot of folks that are part of his real estate company, part of his wineries, part of, part of his hotels, et cetera, a lot of working class Americans who have really enjoyed the opportunity to work for the Trump Organization because they, they have good wages, good health benefits, and a good, a good envir working environment. He employs tens of thousands of people under Ed Trump work. Eric Trump now runs that organization. And so what I noticed with the president was that he never allowed himself to forget what most Americans were struggling with. And he always had an he always reminded himself and stayed close to conversations with people that worked with him or worked for him or part of the American public that he said, you know what, these people do not feel like they're getting a fair shake. And I have had the opportunity to have a more privileged um, experience in this country than 99% of other Americans in this country. And so I'm going to fight for the 99% of Americans that can't fight for themselves in this and have been very frustrated. And I'm going to remind them that there's a way that we can get back to how they, how they felt 20 years ago about the U.S. economy and how, and how we believe that the middle class in this, in this country no longer feels like they can get ahead. And so we've got to show them a pathway to say, I'm going to go to Washington and I'm going to make it so we're not just fighting for the 1% anymore, we're fighting for the middle class of this country. Because they, I will tell you that the middle class in the United States no longer feels like anyone is fighting for them. They feel like they're, they do not have the ability to achieve the American dream anymore. And so what I find in every conversation I've had with the president, I'll be honest with you, is that he always, almost always brings it back to middle class America. How does this affect middle class America? I will also tell you, you get the question a lot, and I'll answer this for all the women in the room, about the president has a lot of, um, gets a lot of kind of comments about how does he feel about women and does he respect women. 
And I can tell you, I, I hope you all get this from being in a room with me, I'm not a shrinking violet by, by most people's accounts. And, and, and in actuality, I've been in the room with a lot of men in business environments who call me, who can call me brash and too direct at times. And so I'm not a shrinking violet. And I will tell you that he makes, um, he values women's opinions as much as any man I've ever worked for. Grab them by the pussy. And so I think quiet. there's a lot of conversation that can be had about um, what the public sentiment might be in terms of what liberals espouse is how they view him. But I will tell you from being in the Oval Office with him, Steve Bannon, Jared Kushner, Reince Priebus, and I will be in the Oval Office. Kellyanne Conway and I will be there with him. Jared and Steve might be dominating the conversation. The president will stop the conversation and say, Katie, what do you think? Kellyanne, what do you think? Or Vanka, what do you think? He wants to have people's input. He learns and listens more than people give him credit for. This man has not been successful because he's never listened to, <laughs> to experts in different fields. And so he takes information in, unlike most people, unlike many people I've seen, and is able to assimilate information and make decisions. And I will tell you that his communication style is very different than anything we've ever seen. And so I think it's incredibly challenging um, for some people to understand how that tone correlates to policies that we've seen the president put in place. And all I can say is that he, he came to be a disruptor. This is the way he's always communicated. It's the way he's always talked. And 63 million Americans voted for it and said, I'm willing to take that bet and deal with that tone because I believe in these policies. Thank you. Uh, next question, yeah. please. We'll go to the gentleman in the second row. Um, yeah, so my question is um, entirely about policies. So um, in the campaign, um, one of the issues that you haven't talked about much was immigration, which was a thing mm -hmm. that was discussed. So um, th there were lots of kind of policy proposals, including the um, uh, border wall on the southern border. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, I just haven't heard much about this since. So, um, sort of, what, what is the situation policy-wise with regards to immigration? Like, where do you think that will go, and where do you think it should go? So, I think there are a couple things in immigration to touch on that are important. I think one is, you know, the first, other than the campaign rhetoric and the campaign promises that the president made about immigration, which was the wall, and that we needed to have a. a kind of comprehensive immigration reform. We talked a lot about this during the campaign, but the first policy you saw come out of the campaign was, the tra was what was the media called the travel ban, which was taking a real look at how are we going to vet and how are we going to look at people trying to come into this country from what we would call kind of, um, you know, countries that we n did not necessarily feel like uh, we had a relationship with that we trusted why these citizens, why these people were trying to come into the country. The travel ban, although the media would not tell you this, had a 63% approval when the president signed it. 63% of Americans agreed with him that we needed increased vetting on people coming into the country from these named countries. And so the media would tell you, I mean, the president's just outrageous. He's so far away from public opinion on this. I mean, look what he wants to do. And the polling would tell you different. So that's the first policy piece out of there I think is really important because the public, the media has really convinced people somehow that the president kind of went out on a limb and did this. When in reality, the majority of the American public is with him on this. And then secondly, I think the, one of the things I do when I give um, talks, and if I had my, my iPad up here with me, I would do it today, is I start off with a quote from the State of the Union about immigration reform. And it talks about increased vetting, and it talks about um, you know, how we should be uh, bringing folks in that obviously have a background that we might need in terms of job opportunities in the United States. And it talks about having, having an open and inclusive conversation, but at the same time being very careful about who the United States lets in for the safety of its citizens. And I give that quote, and I say, what do you all think of this quote from the State of the Union? And people say, oh, the tone's wrong. I don't know if I agree with this, that, or the other thing. This is offensive. And I say, well, that was Barack Obama's State of the Union 2013. I promise you, if you all go back and look at segments of the State of the Union from Barack Obama in 2013 and Trump in, 26, or in 2017, you almost can't tell the difference. The immigration policy is almost identical. In fact, I think the other really important thing to note on all of this is the, immigration, the framework of the immigration policy the president's put forward is almost identical 
to Canada's immigration policy. And no one in here is going to stand up and raise their hand and say they think Canada is just a complete, you know, completely outrageous on their immigration policy. And so with, um, this is, again, I believe the left and the media has caused a fight among the American public in terms of making people believe that Republicans and the president are, out, are completely on, you know, kind of on an island on their own on what immigration policy should look like. When in reality, it's very similar to what President Obama put forward. And in reality, it's almost identical to what Canada puts in place. And so that's why I have a hard time saying that the president is so outrageous on immigration reform. Additionally, the president's actually more middle of the road on DACA than most members of the Republican House of Representatives you'd go over and talk to right now. And so I think what you're seeing in the president is he wants a fix on DACA. Um, he wants increased vetting. He wants a border wall. But other than that, he's very open to saying, look, this, we're a country full of immigrants. And if you want to come to this country for the right reasons, and you want to be part of society, and you want to, and you want to become a citizen and pay taxes and, and, and acclimate to the, to the United States, then we're for that. But because of the, the dangers that we see in our society these days, that countries are dealing with around the world, the UK is dealing with this as well, we have to take another step and vet you further than we did 20, 30, 40 years ago. And that's just the reality of the world we live in now. And that's not something the president has, ma has made. That's something society as a whole has made. So if, if we want to have more open walls and open borders, then we all need to look at ourselves and say, what kind of society are we a part of? Because here's what I'll tell you. The number one kind of conversation we have in America right now is, is Syrian refugees. I don't see any Syrian refugees moving to, to um, elite parts of, of America, moving to Beverly Hills. I don't see any Syrian refugees living next to Hollywood actors and actresses. The left and the liberal elite are fine with Syrian refugees coming in, as long as they don't live next to them. They've never dealt with that before. They haven't. And so when you talk to, when you look at polling and you talk to people that are dealing with this issue and are more scared in their neighborhoods than they've been in the past, and see increased violence in their neighborhoods, and have seen, and have seen you know, record, I would say record violence in some of these areas. These people have the right to say, hold on, what can we do to make these neighborhoods safer? If an increased vetting is part of that, I think that's, that's, that seems reasonable to me. And when you want to tell a family that has lost a family member because of an illegal immigrant coming to this country and causing violence, that we shouldn't have increased vetting, I think that's a hard argument to win. Next question, uh, we'll go to the lady just in the fourth row. Hi. So Hi. I'm a Midwesterner, as you can probably hear. Great, me too. Yeah, I have family in St. Louis, which is really great. Go um, Cards. I'm from Kansas City. Oh, sorry, what parts? Go Cardinals. Oh, yeah. Go, <laughs> no, 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 no. Go Royals. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> so the question I have to ask is actually not about Mr. Trump at all. Okay, great. Um, it's about state government, so I'm hoping that you can answer it. I want to know whether you're familiar with the, um, this is a preliminary question, with, familiar with the series that was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in the Kansas City Star that was Why So Secret Kansas? I don't. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar. That's okay. So basically the gist of it and of the series um, were several different stories about just a lack of transparency in the state. 90% of bills that were passed in the last decade were authored anonymously. Um, and also just... Uh, I think over 70 disappearances within the foster system in the last year and covers up of abuse. So I guess my question is, and this has been a failure on the part of not only the Brownback government, which is Republican, but also the Sebelius Democrat government. Um, and it's just historically been a problem with this gut and go policy. Can I ask what sort of policies should I look for in candidates who are, um, what sort of transparency policies or what could change that would be, um, I don't know, increased transparency in government, I guess. There's a Kansas Open Record ask, um, act, excuse me, mm -hmm. but the uh, records often don't get released or they say that they're lost. Um, I guess what can happen, because there's also a bill that was pitched in March um, that failed in May. I think at 3 a.m. the whole bill was changed and it was replaced instead of the Kansas Transparency Act. So I guess what should I look for from lawmakers? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think you need to look at lawmakers aren't willing to challenge the status quo. Because what, I think what you'll find a lot is that people that are worried about transparency laws are people that have been in office a really long time and maybe don't want to get out there everything they've done, right? And so I think you've got to elect people that are not willing to go to, go to their state capitol or go to Washington and say, you know what, I'm going to do this regardless of whether or not it's going to get me elected in my next term. And that's not an all, always an easy litmus test, right? I mean, someone might say that and they might go to Washington or go to the state capitol and not do that. But I think 
ultimately what we've seen um, as, a, as a whole with candidates is that there is more of a authenticity that needs to be communicated between a candidate and the electorate. And there needs to be an ability to have a more real dialogue and a more real conversation. And the media also is, helps, is actually helpful with this in, order in, in a way of holding these politicians more accountable for promises they've made. And so I think the, it's probably hard, I would say, to look for it on the front end in terms of who you're gonna vote for, but I think once someone gets into office, you can really, if you're gonna vote for them again, look at what they've done in the two or four years of their term and figure out if they've kind of acclimated to the status quo and said, you know what, let's not change these rules because I've got a lot of senior members of this legislative body that don't want to do that. And you know, I don't really want to anger them because I, I, I want a good committee assignment or I want to get reelected and I don't want this member to have to someone have primary me in my election. And so what you're gonna have to see is, does that candidate slash then elected official have the strength and courage to stand up and say, look, this might cost me my next, next election, but what, these people aren't willing to do is worth me standing up and saying, I'm not okay with this. And that's, not, I, would, I would say it's not an easy litmus test and you have to follow <laughs> pretty closely what these folks are voting on and what they're saying on the floor and what they're, what they're proposing in terms of legislation they're putting their names on. But I think obviously being, signing on to transparency acts are important, but I think a lot of it is seeing what they're saying on the campaign trail and if they get elected, making sure to hold them accountable when they're there and then watching what they do with their own career. Because if they just kind of become part of the establishment, then my guess is they're not gonna do what you're hoping they would do, which is kind of shake things up and say, hey, look, we need more transparency. Because the folks that are already there, there's a reason there isn't more transparency. They don't want it. I'm thank not you. super hopeful, but thank you. <laughs> yeah. We have time for one or two more questions. Um, so we'll go to the gentleman uh, wearing the hat. So I have a question. If not the Iran deal, then what? Because if you think about it, doesn't that send a clear message to Kim Jong-un that one president of the United States can sign a deal with him and next one can come to the office and revoke it? So there's one. And two, while the European countries try to stay in the, within the deal, but if they leave it, is that, is not, is, is that not going, going to give um, the existing regime over there? the feeling that we are alone in the world and then we should focus on the nuclear weapon and then the only solution to that will be to invade the country over and over and over again to destroy the, uh, the weapon of mass destruction which would result in civilian casualties. So I think we have to consider the fact that doing nothing is not an option, correct? Yes. Okay, great. So if we all agree that doing nothing is not on the table because if we do nothing then these, you know, these Iran and North Korea will continue to try and acquire, acquire a nuclear weapon. If you agree that that's not an option, then I, I agree with the sanctions that we put on Iran at the beginning, right? And we brought them to the table. But at that point, we really said, we didn't take that leverage to its, to its utmost, what, what we could have gotten out of that deal. Because Iran needed us to relieve sanctions. I mean, their reserves and their banks were gone. Their currency was devalued 73%. They had huge amounts of of um, chaos in that country because of what was happening to the economy. And so at that point, you had to have an American president that led with strength. And instead, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, you had an American president that just kind of wanted to capitulate and wanted everyone to just kind of like him and let's just get along, and let's make a deal because I feel really good about getting around a table and talking and I feel really good about saying I got a deal done. And instead, you're gonna have, you're right. I mean, what we are, the message that we are sending is one president might, might make a deal with you and the next president might revoke it. But the, quite the, it, the thing we're really sending is, we're not gonna let you keep acting this way. This is, you can have any president here you want and some of these deals might look somewhat different. But at the end of the day, we're not gonna let you acquire a nuclear weapon. And how this president goes about it and how that president goes about it might look slightly different. But at the end of the day, the United States is gonna keep its foot on your neck and you're not gonna get to, to build a nuclear weapon capability. And so. I think that's the part of the conversation that I think the global uh, geopolitical environment needs to take into account, which is the United States in the last eight years under Obama had not been led by a president of, full of strength. He wanted to kind of have this conversation among many nations and, have, and get to this deal so he could go home and claim victory, that he got a deal. But the deal worked. The uranium- How do you know, how, did it? Because the, yes, because the uranium, uranium enrichment program was stopped. 
Do, well, first of and all, now they can go in and they can uh, go we, back to it as fast as they can. We can. Well, first of all, I, I would argue that we don't know if it stopped or not. And they and also I know now you were talking about the sanctions, the the thirty day trial period, which is true. It, However, now and they have twenty four days. When we say we want to go in, they have twenty four days to move stuff around. Yes, but and get rid of evidence. It is twenty four. It is heavy equipment. It's quite difficult to hide it. That's one, and two. Um, now, if the deal is completely dropped out, they'll drop every, uh, every possible possibility for us to actually go into the country without invading it and seeing, are they actually curving it, are they not? So they can continue with the program and the ground. So I'm sure you remember this. I'm sure you remember this. But we, it. the United States Senate passed Iran sanctions 99 to 1. So my guess is the United States is going to put sanctions back on Iran if we don't believe that they're gonna comply with what we want them to comply with, and we're gonna bring them back to the table. And we're gonna say, we don't agree with the deal President Obama made with you, so we're gonna devalue your currency again. We're gonna make you come back to the table and need us again, and this time your deal's not gonna be as good. No, no, thank you, thank you, no, thank you. Um, we have time for one final question, um, so we'll go to the gentleman in the front row. This is about the um, midterm elections. So you talked about the kind of changing trajectory for Republicans, and I guess this interests me as an NRSC alum. But um, who did you work for at the NRSC? Ward Baker. Oh, okay. So um, before, I mean, last summer Republicans were awfully confident about their chances in the Missouri Senate race specifically. Yeah. And I know that seems to have somewhat changed recently. I mean, judging by the amount of articles in Politico on this. But um, so Josh Hawley, I believe, brought you on board to help with fundraising as of late. Yes. Um, how do you think some of the panic over that race specifically is kind of much ado about nothing and unrealistic expectations about where the race would be at this point? Or do you think, I mean, he still stands a very good chance at, I mean, winning the seat in November? Yeah. So first of all, I think you have to, as a table setter, Missouri is a state the president won by 19 points in 2016. Um, and it's a state where he today has 53% approval. On election day in 2016, he had 47% approval. So what those numbers would tell you is that if the election were today, if Trump were on the ballot today, he actually win by more than 19 points. So the president's approval has gone up in the state of Missouri from election day when he won by 19 points. I think Claire McCaskill has done a really good job of trying to uh, raise the expectation on Josh Hawley because it's her only option as a narrative. Because if you're Claire McCaskill, you voted against tax cuts, you voted against Neil Gorsuch, um, you didn't vote to, to confirm Gina Haspel for CIA director, and these are all policies that are incredibly popular in Missouri. What is your path to victory in Missouri? Your only path to victory is to try and convince people that Josh Hawley isn't meeting expectations and that he's not gonna do what he needs to do to beat you. And so you kind of make him weak and you make him look unexperienced and you make him look like you can't, can't put a campaign together to run against an incumbent senator. But that, quite frankly, is her only play. And so what I would tell you from that, from the articles that were written in Politico and I, personally uh, don't necessarily advocate that everyone believe everything they read in Politico, um, although they're a great news source for a number of things. Um, I would tell you that I think it's really, really interesting to me, and I think what is shown is an ability, again, for Democrats to co-opt the media, to put a narrative in place that helps them, as opposed to actually talking about policies. Because what Claire doesn't want to do is talk to the Missouri electorate about policies because she's wrong, according to the Missouri electorate, on almost everything. And so if she can keep the conversation on how terrible Josh Hawley's doing and not talk about tax cuts or Gina Haspel being uh, confirmed to CIA director or deregulation or a pure place Obamacare, which is also over 50% approval in the state of Missouri, if she talks about that, she's gonna lose. And so I think it's Claire's uh, last ditch effort to control the narrative uh, in the Missouri Senate race, and I think she will ultimately fail at it. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today, but please join me in thanking Ms. Katie Walsh for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.